Welcome to Sputnik with me, George Galloway. And me, Joseph Hyatt, standing in for Gayatri. Last week, we would have been celebrating the 60th birthday of the late and incomparable Comandante Hugo Chavez. Instead, we continue to mourn his loss keenly. Chavez won more elections of referenda in fewer years than any political leader in history. But that didn't stop US politicians and media routinely referring to him as a dictator. His successor, President Nicolas Maduro, has been carrying on the traditions of Chavez and also of winning elections. But that hasn't stopped the onslaught from the land of the free, home of the brave, the United States of America. And just like in the Ukraine that we'll be talking about later, the US just won't take yes for an answer, at least a yes from the Venezuelans. Joining us on board the Sputnik for the first time is His Excellency Alvaro Sanchez, the Charge d'Affaires, at the Venezuelan Embassy in London. Your Excellency, thanks for joining us. A moment of reflection on the passing of the great uh, Chief Comandante Hugo Chavez, would have been 60 years old this week. It's a cruelly young age uh, at which he was taken from us. My wife and I worked in the last presidential election that he won handsomely. He was a force of nature, unstoppable, except nature and, uh, and illness took him uh, from us. How are the Venezuelans remembering Hugo Chavez this week? Yeah, well, first, uh, George, thank you very much for having me in such an important uh, occasion, as you mentioned. This would have been the 60th anniversary of uh, President Chavez. Well, uh, uh, the legacy of uh, Chavez, not only in Venezuela, but actually all throughout Latin America and even the world, is very, very visible. Uh, this week, for example, uh, we are currently uh, celebrating uh, or, or commemorating the, the third uh, Congress of the PSUV, the, the political party that was uh, founded. It was the idea of President Chavez so, to bring together different groups, different trends uh, uh, from the less progressive movements, etc., into one single uh, uh, political party. And, and this week, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, we, we had uh, our third uh, Congress. Uh, uh, it, it was evident uh, uh, the level of, of uh, uh, communication, uh, working together uh, of all the people uh, that are actually form part of this uh, organization, this uh, political party. And on, not only that, but also uh, President Maduro himself said it uh, in one of his addresses to, to the whole uh, 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 party that uh, uh, from here on the political party is going to actually participate more in the, in the dealings of the actual government, uh, uh, which w is one of the uh, legacies of, of President Chavez to have um, uh, grassroots uh, 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 people uh, actually uh, operating and participating fully in, in government. So this is so, it's not just a government of technocrats, exactly. but it's a government popularly based. Exactly, exactly. So you can tell that this is actually a uh, people's power. And, and, and as I said, uh, uh, our political tradition in Venezuela for many, many years, not only the, the, the years prior to the election of uh, Chavez in 1998, but even before then, all throughout the 20th century, uh, uh, we didn't have much tradition in terms of uh, uh, actually having a, a, a solid uh, grassroots organizations and, and much less transforming those grassroots organizations into political power. Uh, 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 that's what Chavez perceived practically from early on in his, mm. in his presidency. Poder popular. Exactly, yeah, people's power, and, and, and transformed that and, and, and brought those uh, uh, masses uh, uh, constructively into, into actually the whole governing process. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away. There are many things that the popular uh, people's power uh, actually reached and were able to accomplish. Uh, uh, for example, 30,000 communal councils were set up in, in Venezuela, and they were fully getting uh, the, uh, the hang of participating in government. But this level of participation that we're seeing with, with, with the uh, 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 Congress that is taking place in, in Venezuela, PSUV Congress, 
uh, 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 it, it really went to a, to a, a great positive uh, 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 step. Uh, uh, as I said, this was one of the major dreams of, of President Chavez. One of uh, President Chavez's election pledges in that last election in which I worked was that every Venezuelan would have a dignified house by the end of his presidential term. Is his successor, President Maduro, committed to that? And what are the chances? of that being achieved. I think it's, it's, it's really, really, uh, uh, really good to see uh, uh, that particular achievement in the uh, Bolivarian Revolution. Half million social houses have been built in Venezuela for the benefit of, of, of the poorest uh, people. Actually, many of those people uh, uh, lost everything they had in the landslides. That From the barrios which exactly. slipped down the hillsides. And they've been rehoused. Exactly. They've been rehoused. Uh, again, half million social houses. I mean, it's easier to, easy to say it, but, but think about it. I mean, not many countries, not many societies have accomplished uh, uh, such task and such goal. And again, this was the, 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 the idea, the craft of, of President Chavez in 2010, as soon as he saw the unfortunate circumstances in which many Venezuelans were in at the time because of these uh, lands slides, uh, uh, he immediately, immediately set up a whole plan, a state plan apparatus to, to, to make sure that this project was uh, going to take place. And, and in fact, uh, uh, President Maduro has not but just continue with these uh, fantastic uh, uh, programs. Uh, uh, recently, as recently as, as, as a few days ago, uh, uh, many of you probably have heard because uh, uh, the news, and in, in a, in a, in not in a positive way, but actually in a very negative way, in this country and in many other countries, have been um, writing and informing about uh, a, a process by which in Venezuela we uh, currently took uh, residents of a, an older building that were not in very safe conditions and they were actually taken from from those uh, uh, from that edification called a uh, tower david's tower and they were actually moved into a whole social housing complex a dignified complex uh, uh, for these families and, and, and children the media failed to recognize that mm -hmm. they were actually moved to to a housing complex and concentrated on the fact on, that they were moved out exactly well exactly. that's the media uh, we have every child in venezuela uh, either has or is about to have access to a computer. You've built more universities than any country in the entire world. These are fantastic achievements uh, of the Bolivarian Revolution. President Maduro, of course, is not Chavez. Nobody is Chavez. Uh, how is he doing in adjusting to the task of filling the shoes of such a very great figure? As you said, it's, it's, it's not easy. Uh, 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 not only President Maduro, but no one in Venezuela, I would say no one in Latin America. No one in the world. In no one in the world uh, 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 can actually uh, fully fill Chavez's uh, 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 shoes. Uh, uh, and, and, and I really don't think that the Venezuelan population, Venezuelan voters, are actually expecting from Maduro to be a, a photocopy of Chavez. Uh, what they're expecting from Maduro, I think they're getting it, which is leadership, command, knowledge of the situation. I mean, he's a very able man, a very experienced man. He's a, let's not forget that he's a worker. He's I, knew a him bus driver. I knew him from the days he was a bus driver. We were members of the same transport uh, union. That, that's it's one of the reasons why I was very right, close right, to him when he was the foreign minister. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, President Chavez is legacy is, is known and it's so famous and it's respected both from its critics and fans. What would you say would be the one key thing, obviously, in the capitalist society of here that really could be uh, a constructive lesson learned from, from President Chavez? Well, that, that's a good point. If, and from an economic point of view, well, uh, I think in one of Chavez's legacies is that he was able to beat uh, uh, the capitalist system in their own game. What I mean by this, uh, uh, when Chavez came to power and, and, and he immediately said, like, well, we need to do cer certain things need to change in Venezuela, the state needs to be more involved in the economy, there are certain industries that we need to nationalize, the social welfare system needs to be strengthened. Immediately, those uh, uh, people who know a lot about the economy worldwide said, well, that sounds very good, but that's not going to work uh, economically, and therefore, you're going to have lots of economic issues. Namely, you're not going to uh, ha have growth in the country. Well, 
actually, before Chavez died, we went through an average growth of 4%. Wow. And this is something that no one really expected, taking into account that Chavez had changed the rules of, of the capitalist system in a way that was to favor uh, socially the masses of the population. The economy is the key. Uh, as Bill Clinton famously put it, it's the economy, economy stupid. stupid. And whilst all other things, cultural and other foreign policy things, Venezuela's foreign policy is exemplary, an example to the entire world, and so on. But in the end, it's potatoes on the plate, it's production, it's uh, consumption, goods in the shops, and so on. Venezuela still has some distance to travel on that front. Yeah, um, I think uh, we currently, as a matter of fact, going through a major restructuring of the whole state uh, apparatus. Uh, in the key, the aim, and President Maduro has been very explicit and, and has worked very hard in order to achieve, is to make sure that we continue to be socialists, but at the same time we need to be productive. Uh, uh, so, so um, how to do that uh, is a process of uh, or a process that has been in place that again President Chavez always thought about that as well but let's not forget that well you know about this much more than, than me is that from the kind of a colonial uh, legacy that Venezuela and Latin America had for not just a few years but for 500 years and, and, and our dependency exclu exclusively on commodities and particularly uh, oil uh, in order, even though we have been in, in power, the Bolivarian Revolution, for 15 years, in order to distangle ourselves from that critical uh, and, I would say, negative uh, uh, past that still uh, inflict uh, 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 upon what we do economically and otherwise uh, nowadays, it takes uh, quite a long time. Uh, we, you will know the, the consequences of uh, colonialism uh, everywhere, and we're not an exception. So, but we, I think we have covered a, a great deal of uh, 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 a great path. And we're currently in the process of, as President Maduro said, of, of making sure, strengthening the productive sector, but still keeping in mm. mind that we're a socialist nation. Well, uh, uh, it was said uh, by a very great uh, Irishman, Oscar Wilde, that right-wing people knew the price of everything and the value of nothing. <laughs> it's yeah. equally wrong, though, yeah, to yeah. know the value of everything and, and the no price, price of, of nothing. nothing. Uh, Your Excellency, thanks very much, and uh, we remember with solemnity, but also with joy, uh, the example of your late president. Thank you very much for very joining much. us uh, on the Sputnik. Coming up after the break, we'll be looking at the linguistics of conflict narratives. Who are the militants and the extremists? Who are the moderates and the governments that need to be supported? I promise you, you don't want to miss it. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sputnik. The linguistics of conflict narratives has always been a fascinating subject to me, and nowhere more so than at the present, in the wars currently being fought out in Syria, Palestine, Libya, the Ukraine, etc. Ukraine now, in the Western narrative, has a government, without reference to the fact that it came to power by virtue of a Western-backed violent coup led by self-professed ultra-nationalists some say neo-Nazi elements, who overthrew the actual government, that is, the one that had been elected by the people. Those who refused to accept the coup against the government they elected have become terrorists at worst and separatist rebels at best. The Ukrainian government is now bombing its own people, and that becomes something we must support, whilst the Syrian government bombing its own people becomes something against which we must intervene, i.e. bomb. In serious conflict, Al-Qaeda-type extremists are rebranded as moderate Islamists, except when they cross into Iraq, at which precise point they become extremists again, and so on and on. And rather than by overt design, this Orwellian doublespeak seems to wheel into action by simple osmosis. No minutes of a COBRA committee meeting ordering the linguistic bombardments exist, and probably no such orders were ever given, no such meetings were ever convened. It seems there's no need to. The media takes an invisible cue. Joining us to discuss this is Mamoun Alabasi, a linguistics expert and also a respected analyst and writer 
on many of today's battlegrounds, principally those in the Middle East. Mamon, thank you very much for uh, joining us. What lies behind the nomenclature? Uh, that's uh, one of the points I want to get to uh, with you. How do we decide what we describe different actors in these conflicts as? Right. Sometimes the same act, if we are uh, in favor of a certain government, the same act will be overlooked, maybe excused, maybe given context. If you see the bombing of the UN school in Gaza, for example, the, the bombing itself was condemned. Israel wasn't condemned. And then we hear about something about Hamas may have been placing uh, rockets there. So once the, uh, you take a side, the news itself is presented differently. Mm. Whereas um, in other places where um, the enemy uh, is clearly defined, we highlight and uh, repeat and repeat the, the ugliness of this enemy everywhere. Where I would slightly disagree with you is, is with regards to the uh, Al-Qaeda-inspired militants. They've always been presented as the number one threat, even in Syria. Now, everybody's talking about how those militants coming from Syria, they're going to bombard the West. Security companies are ringing their bell. The airports are, um, you know, uh, taking extra measures. Um, um, we're, we're anticipating more uh, grooming of, of Muslims and more spying on them, more informants. Um, the fact that they are uh, in Syria hasn't changed. The fact that the, um, the government of President Assad is not an ally hasn't reduced the, um, the main focus, which is on anything that is Islamist. So anything that's Islamist, even if it's, uh, you know, if it's anti-Bashar, if it's Islamist, then it's the number one enemy. It's the number well, one it's threat. the number one enemy when and it it's comes one home. Threat. Yeah. It's the number one enemy when it gets back here. But I, I was trapped in a lift, or he was trapped with me, with William Hague quite recently, the former foreign secretary. And I, I said to him this, you've been wrong all your life, but you've never been insane before. Now the policy you're following in Syria is actually insane, not least because the people you are encouraging with non-lethal military aid and money and political and diplomatic support to go to Syria and overthrow the regime there one day they'll come back uh, here. And uh, I asked David Cameron on the floor of the House, what's the difference between the Al-Qaeda that were going to Mali to help the French to kill and the Al-Qaeda in Syria that directly and indirectly us and the Americans are backing? Well, to be fair, there are, there are many groups on the ground in Syria, and the ones that support, are supported by the West are supposedly the, the moderates who are being fought by Al-Qaeda, the Al-Qaeda ones and uh, the I IS ones, mm. who incidentally, by the way, until recently, IS fighters have never been engaged in a single battle with the forces of Assad. They've always lived uh, peacefully, and even the, the oil would be sold from areas under ISIS control into Assad. So we have all weird, f weird strange mm. alliances. Mm. Um, the average Syrian who is critical of the government of Bashar um, or as a refugee has this conspiracy theory that ISIS is not just um, Western-backed, it's Iranian-backed. Of course, it's a conspiracy theory, but you can't, you must an, think... An, an absurd one. Uh, but, we, we've actually seen the videos of ISIS massacring huge numbers of people, but purely if, on but the basis if, of if their religion. Large, if a large number of people think that way, mm. it means there is some sort of different points of view on the ground. In Gaza, Israelis are killed whilst Palestinians die. I have at least 50 examples in the multinational, international mass media of descriptions of Pal 20 Palestinians, 50, 100 died today, whilst one or two Israelis were killed right. uh, today, right. yeah. killed and died. Right. Right. Uh, the pursuit of tunnels and militants right. in Gaza, when 75% of the people killed in Gaza have been civilians, and most of those have been women and children, nothing to do with tunnels or militancy. So where does all this come out of? Just pure political bias? Um, yes, and, and unfortunately the, the narrative is shaped not by politicians, by, by the media, who we know it's you know, owned by a handful of people with certain agendas. So that's, that's really unfortunate, but it's, it's, there's the context, the whole idea of occupation, the whole notion of resistance, the whole idea according to international law it's allowed. All of that is dropped out. Nobody's really uh, focusing on that. But I don't want to be here bombasting just one side of the media. I, we, ha we must acknowledge that majority of international media, with no exception, take one line or another. And they have this worldview, like, let's say me and you agree on Gaza, and we agree on uh, Ukraine. 
we don't have to necessarily agree on Syria, but there's been this kind of line, if you're at one station, you have one worldview when it comes to Syria, to Gaza, to uh, Palestine, to Iraq, to, and if you, from the other side, you have another worldview. Mm. And this looks like different planets, and if, let's say, a Martian watching, you wouldn't no, know that, who to believe, uh, that's, unfortunately. That's, that's, uh, but the truth is really... That's true, although some uh, stations acknowledge it and others deny it. I mean, the BBC, right. for example, calls other people state broadcasters, while is right. itself a state broadcaster. But of course, there was that outrageous statement, wasn't there, by what many would call uh, one of the world's top terrorists, George W. Bush, when he stated that there were states in the Middle East of the axis of evil. How much do you think that is such statement has a legacy in today in terms of its impact? Uh, things have dramatically changed uh, since, since then. Um, remember that the, these states, that even the people he would call uh, axis of evil, it was North Korea, uh, Iraq and, and Iran. Today there is talk of rapprochement with Iran. We have an idea that uh, the United States might be cooperating with Iran to fight ISIS. You have the Israeli joining in, being anti-ISIS. Everybody's become a friend. The Gulf states, the number one enemy to the Gulf states is ISIS because they, they pose an extremist point of view that is, claims to be Islamic, that aims to overthrow them. So everybody's happy to, to to join but, but ranks, so agree, things have changed. Would, would you agree with the suggestion that uh, George Bush suggesting that there were axes of evil existed? Prominent majority of those countries he labelled was in the Middle East. Would you agree with some people suggest that this language as a term very much set a, of a path of this kind of Islamophobia that we do of, see of existing? Of course, of course, and, and this was, you know, uh, um, I mean, it's one of those uh, cartoonish, you know, presentation <laughs> of things. Mm. It, it came at a time when uh, Khatimi was offering a, a, a dialogue of civilization, and he stopped the the enrichment of of, of uranium. So he kind of slapped this this gesture with with more uh, uh, escalation. And then we saw what what happens with uh, with Iraq, which is totally unjustifiable, and we're still paying for for the price for that. But it's that that, that language. That Israel is the is the gravest case in point. Uh, here we continue to endlessly receive a narrative that the Israelis are the victims and the Palestinians the perpetrators. When we know, and most of the people watching this show know, uh, that the opposite is the case. That these people in Gaza who are being bombed remorselessly with nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, are themselves, 80% of them, refugees from Palestine. They were driven right. to Gaza. And because they continue to exist and resist, by existing they resist, they are a, a mortal threat to the settler control of their land. How solid in the media, you're a media man, how solid is the Israeli narrative? Do journalists and broadcasters really believe it or are they um, pretending to believe it? I think it's difficult. They've, they've grown accustomed to a certain line, which they've been used to, and it's difficult to change. What's happening, though, uh, through thanks to social media and other uh, media outlets, um, they've been exposing what's really going on. So they've been caught off guard. At one point, they, they continue with this old-fashioned, archaic narrative. On the other hand, the youth, the people who, who follow social media, have noticed there's a different story going on. Um, we've mentioned the, the one in, 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 in Gaza, for example. You, you say there's all those, the idea of a conflict. There is no conflict. There is an occupation. There's a, you know, a, a tremendous uh, disproportionate uh, use of power. There's no conflict between two equal sides. And that's why we've got many people so very much unhappy the way with the, how the mainstream the, uh, you know, media is reporting things. That's why people are going out in, in the thousands in protest. I mean, there was a protest against even BBC coverage. People, you shouldn't protest that, you should be protesting an atrocity, uh, you know, but it, it, to the extent that you go and out and protest a way a certain uh, channels is covering an event, it means many people are really, really fed up of that. And, and this is, you know, thanks to social media and the alternative that, ca you know, cash in in that and they would, you know, uh, fill that niche. So people are aware, luckily. Mamun, thanks very much Thank you. Thank for you. helping us through that thicket of misinformation. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Joseph? Well, on the, obviously, anniversary of President Hugo Chavez's birthday, Oko Bolo says, Hugo Chavez will be remembered in the same light as Che Guevara, hero. And uh, Sukhanjalo says, a legend, Che Guevara would have been proud. There is no easy walk to self-determination anywhere. Absolutely right. 
And of course, on the point of the uh, linguistics and how obviously terminology affects the international community, uh, Secunda says social media debunking mainstream media lies. Media no longer reporting news but playing politics. I think that uh, the political class and the media class are way behind the curve on this. They have not quite grasped how momentous the change of paradigm is by the impact of social media. You know that in the great two million march in 2003 against the war in Iraq, it's very difficult to find footage of it because camera phones hadn't been invented yet. And just 11 years later, everyone has a camera phone. Everyone is therefore a potential citizen journalist. And the citizen journalists can usually be trusted more than the ones we pay to be journalists. And that's all we've got time for this week, sir. Which, unfortunately, means that's the end of the show. Follow us on Twitter. It's RT underscore Sputnik. And, of course, on Facebook, it's Sputnik on Russia Today. But from me, Joseph Hyatt, it's goodbye. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.